Yeah, retroactive. So the, the amazing thing was that uh, in this moment of uh, repetition of, of a journey, it's a repetition of a journey that even his own uh, uh, teacher has. By the way, when he did those cloud drawings five years after the first competition and they were published in Zodiac, all the writers started to treat those as the original drawing. Right? So the red book drawing, done, the, the, this drawing you see here, immediately was f referred to as the first drawing of the project. This is often referred to as the first sketch, which was done two years after the competition. The drawing of the clouds, which was done five years after the competition, then took over as the first sketch. So basically he keeps, he keeps doing the first sketch, and the first sketch is, is different. Uh, by the way, each of his reports for Zodiac magazine gets longer and longer. It starts with a few pages and it ends up being the entire issue. And each and every article he publishes in Zodiac about the project distorts the timeline and disguises the fact that they have no idea what's going on with the project. No idea at all. In fact, I've got this argument that the, the, the more that the project's in crisis, the bigger the, and the most powerful and the longer the article is. The reason why the final one takes a whole issue is that they're out of control at that point. Not by chance does Utzon every time do some new sketches and publish these kind of uh, 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 reports at exactly the moment. Uh, and not by chance does he do each and every report as a sort of minor development is, is done. So for example, in September of 1961, after five years of failure and 12 different geometric systems by Arab trying to understand how the shells would work, they finally figured it out that you could make the shells in the same way that one could slice an orange, and he returns to Sydney in March 1962 with the so-called yellow book, and this is the cover with the new scheme. Uh, Ofer Arab is enormously angry that the architect has been the one to finally figure out um, how to do uh, uh, the shells. He comes back with this, with this book and everybody's so happy, his, his smile returns, but you can see the guy is already a little bit older, he's still got a very nice tie and so on, and the smile is there, but he's an older guy. Uh, uh, already. This process has been uh, uh, in incredibly bad, but while they're smiling, a piece of concrete from the platform so large it almost destroyed uh, one of the tourist boats in Sydney Harbour because actually the platform that they had built four years earlier no longer would fit with the shells. They had figured out how to do the shells, but they had to dynamite the existing platform in order to rearrange it to get the new shells. Uh, and so literally in this moment, exactly when he's presenting the, the book, there was the following day in the newspaper, this huge piece of concrete accidentally flew out from the dynamite and almost wiped out a tourist vessel. So this moment of calm and light, this is the world of the architect's ideas, is also a world of huge pieces of concrete flying uh, uh, through the air. <laughs> And also, uh, unbelievable uncertainty, and he and Ove Arab are, are at war. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. They're at war. This is the first building to be given, seriously given computer analysis. There are amazing images of Ove Arab having every part of the model of this building attached to, to data sensors and so on to feed the analysis. And all of that computerization was not able to produce a single scenario. In the end, it was this very simple idea of the orange uh, that would do it. Uh, you can see that there's been an enormous amount of uh, stress and that finally there's a kind of relief that shows through. Um, so again, a much older guy. We look like 15 years older. He looks happy. Uh, there's one guy in his office who's not so happy. <laughs> this one is very, very eager. Uh, even his teeth seem to have uh, changed uh, their geometry a little bit. Uh, um, and, and there's a sort of a nervous joy. And he even, you see, see the sort of look? Here it is, um, a nice tie again, right? Very well orchestrated, but just a much older, more thoughtful person. Um, and again, he starts doing the magic hands to show everybody how it can work, how simple it is to make this geometry. He makes movies about it. He even wears a kind of artistic sweater and sits in front of a kind of Lucarusia type uh, background to wave his magic left hand up in the air to indicate what this beautiful light object would do. In other words, this is an image of lightness, which is the so heavy and the forces are so great that the best engineer in the world at that time couldn't control those forces. So this light hand of his that waves around, every time it moves up in the air, the engineers are cringing. <laughs> <laughs> Again, here he is standing in front, of, now he's back home, he goes back home and he makes another interview to say the project is going well. Again, very nice suit, right hand in the pocket, he's in control, doesn't need to do any work. Left hand doesn't even have to open, it's just vaguely there, and all this stuff is behind him. He's like, he's almost like wearing it, like it's kind of connected to his elbow. It's like he's wearing this very exotic piece of geometry. 
And again, imagine that an architect in, is, is showing this series of geometric images and holding this piece of a model in order to communicate the concept uh, 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 of the project. And this is the platform at that moment, because in this moment, when finally they understand the geometry of the shell, um, you can almost see the pieces of the platform that had to be demolished in order for the shells to arrive. This is an enormous uh, uh, object, a kind of military grade uh, object, and he himself emigrates with his family to Australia in this moment. That is to say, just at the moment they're about to begin the shells, he inserts himself between the shells and the, and the platform, exactly as all the visitors would be required to search. So kind of a romantic moment for him uh, to arrive. And in March of 1963, he actually arrives uh, with his family, and then it starts to grow. And whatever you know about this building, it's much bigger than you think it is. Right? It's really one of the great achievements. Here's Ove Arab's drawing of all the different geometries they tried until they found the right one. And actually, you could say this is a compliment to Utsun because this is like an animal. It's like a bird or something flexing itself. It's like as if the idea had these different uh, 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 potentials. And you see him, again, power suit, standing in front of the construction. The left hand is no longer operative. Right? But it's still catching the light. Look at that. It's just, just, just nothing about it. It's, it's not that the left hand is in the light. It's like producing light. I mean, it must be, it would be super annoying to live with him because the bedroom always at night, there'd be this sort of glow and it'd be like, turn your hand off. And if you, but if you, and if you think I'm joking, uh, you know, you know. So he's, he's, he's like throwing this thing up. Right, that's how beautiful it is. But if you look in his face, it's not so calm. Right, he's doing what he's supposed to do. Look at the tie, it's not working out so well. The shirt's not quite in the place that it should be. This is, actually if you look at it, it looks great, but actually you can see in here the seeds of, of, uh, uh, of disaster. And it's in, exactly in the moment of this image that he publishes this, which is a full issue of Zodiac magazine describing the project, on which on the cover you see a bird, it's a seagull, because he saw a film of a seagull in Antarctica and he said, that seagull can teach me how to do the glass on the front of the opera house. It's not even an Australian bird. And the Antarctica, I can tell you, is not Australia. It's not so far away. So he takes a non-Australian bird flying over non-Australian water and he obsesses about the ripples of that water and then comes up with this geometry. You see here the geometry of the glass, which will be based on the movement of the bird. In other words, there will be a kind of animal-like sense of movement in this object, which is meant to represent the air. So an animal that flies in the air, a piece of mobile architecture in the air, will actually give the shape to these vaults. And he himself is photographed as a seagull. I mean, and you have to, you have to consider how tricky it is to photograph an architect, again, flying. And of course, this, Again, this is the cover, this is the, the, the frontispiece image for the Zodiac issue. So what he's communicating to you is that the architect is an animal that can fly, right? And that the work produced by an architect itself will fly. Again, getting back, remember the, the, the principle. He, every journey he makes is not from A to B, but is a journey that he already made before he made the journey. The journey is but an echo of what he would always do. His responsibility is to graft something foreign onto the local that lets the local be what it always wanted to be. So he brings to Australia something that he claims to have found somewhere else that in fact he was already doing somewhere else in order to claim that it was already there and he's as, as it were literally flying uh, and the architecture itself will fly and he flies. And again you may have all of your opinions about the publicity campaigns of all the various architects that are on the super stage uh, today but you have to consider what it would be if any one architect today would do a photograph like this. I mean, of course, we could have a competition for the most uh, uh, pretentious uh, uh, publicity image by an architect, and it would be a pretty serious competition, and each of the superstars of today would have, would have a number of pretty damaging photographs for us to compete with, but this might well ultimately be uh, uh, the winner. Here again, we see him on the side. This is, a, again, this is in the same month. So the same month of that first photograph, the same month is published that Zodiac issue, all about the amazing quality of this new project. And here he is taking the clients around the side. But again, if you read the images, um, they are happier now than he is. Right? It's a very strange reversal of the economy. And here he is 
two weeks later resigning from the job, because basically what happened, um, there were many things that happened, but Ove Arab was basically privately taking over the job and refusing uh, ideas that he had worked on, and so he said, I'm resigning. So same tie, elegant, restrained, no smile on the face, turned down. All the other architects who had originally said they didn't want any foreign architects to enter the competition, now protested for him to stay. Our architects like Harry Seidler and others, from originally from Vienna, I think, now become part of the defense campaign to keep him, but it's too late, he goes. And the project is finally finished 10 years later and has this enormous opening, and of course, from the moment it is open, becomes one of the great icons, uh, uh, not just of Australia, but of our, uh, uh, of our field. So what I'm saying here is that there's an extraordinarily strange and intimate circuit between home and journey in which all the key discoveries are all already made. And by the way, his decision to be an architect comes from the fact that his parents travel to see the great exhibition in Stockholm and come back and modernize their own lives. And as a result, he does that. And then he goes to the office of Alvar Aalto to make uh, uh, some work and then repeats all the journeys that Alvar Aalto made. And then in his studio at the time that the geometry was figured out was a young Rafael Moneo, who was the one that actually figured out the geometry system that he did. And the moment that Moneo stops, that Moneo came to the office of Utsun, having also made exactly the same journey of visiting Alto, etc., the same echo. So Rasmussen goes to, goes to uh, Utsun, goes to Moneo, uh, 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 and so on. Uh, in fact, um, um, Utzon was the son of a naval architect who had been educated in England um, and he himself left occupied Denmark for Sweden for the rest of the war. 1949 goes to Finland, works for Alvar Alto for six weeks. His wife becomes pregnant. I've always been a little suspicious of the timing. He then returns to, um, uh, uh, to Denmark. Um, 1948 he goes to Morocco, so he's traveling. Um, and he increasingly broadens the range and distance of his journeys to, as it were, catch up with the images that he had already produced. And every single journey he makes, he finds where he goes, things that he has already drawn. 1949 gets a scholarship to the United States, which he uses to go to Mexico to encounter the ancient temple sites. And he uses that encounter to retroactively explain the Opera House project that will enable him to get to China that he'd been writing about before more than a decade earlier because his teacher had visited to China. In other words, travel comes out of design more than design comes out of travel. It's not that he travels and then learns how to design. His ability to travel comes from design. And of course, with his final image for Utsun, he identifies himself with the flying seagull and so on, and his, fly, his famous smile has gone. Uh, his, his role in the project had been constantly challenged. All of the interiors and glass walls, that, which were the things that tormented him the most, were not used in the way that he did, and he resigned in February of 1966. He had nothing to do with the project, but here's the amazing thing to finish. When he, finally he resigns, he doesn't go straight back home. He goes to Hawaii uh, and returns to Denmark by way of Mexico, and goes back to the Yucatan and looks again at the Mayan temples and writes to his Australian assistant and says, the ruins are wonderful, so why worry? The Sydney Opera House will become a ruin one day. So he's thrilled that after all this project, when it is eroded down, will look exactly like Mexico. He also writes to Siegfried Gideon, who had used his article about the Sydney Opera House as the basis of the last edition of Space, Time and Architecture. And he said to Gideon, don't worry, I'm going to use the ideas that I worked on in Sydney and other projects so that my return home will be just as productive as my departure from it. And sure enough, he did. He completed a set of small, highly celebrated buildings with much of the Sydney Opera House logic developed in different sites. Finally, in 1999, too old to travel, he agreed to do the design guidelines to renovate the building back to the original design that he had already done. And in that moment, he writes another article repeating all this narrative, which is not true, about his journeys to Mexico and so on. But then he qu quotes Louis Kahn's comment about the Opera House. He quotes Louis Kahn saying, the sun did not know how beautiful it was until reflected off this building, right? So if it's the case that what the architect does is allow people to see their world for the first time, and in so doing, seeing the world invents a whole new world, and if it's a whole new planet that, that the Mayans made possible, the sun itself is just hanging around for two million years with a kind of identity crisis, doesn't know what's going on, looks down at Australia and sees itself glowing there and says, I'm beautiful. Right? 
So Utzon's last gesture, when he says, I'm too old to travel, I don't hold anything against you, I'm just a humble architect, but as Louis Kahn said, I did invent the sun. Uh, <laughs> Which, of course, explains why his hand was always, and I didn't think about that until now, why his hand was always uh, uh, glowing, because he, he basically owned the sun from the uh, beginning, like one of those superhero movies that something happened to him as a kid, uh, and so on and so on. So all I'm saying, of course, is that, is that this restates the promise that every single architect makes, including the architect, all the architects in this room, uh, and none of the artists will make, that the architect Architecture is a foreign object which is grafted into an existing context and an existing environment that allows the environment to become more like itself than itself. Um, and that the architect's journey, and therefore architecture itself, um, like every coffee I have in the morning, is a profoundly strange thing. Thanks. Okay, rapid questions. Or we go to the mine and have a beer. <laughs> yeah. Could you explain why? Because it seemed to me that Sarah was talking. Yes. He came late and he did the job. Yes. What was it? Can you explain? Yeah, I don't know the answer to the question. There is some debate about whether or not the other jurors, of course, say we hadn't thrown that project out. Um, if you look at those jurors, they threw it out. There's no way that they looked. It's just, this is a really, very radical design. I think only Saarinen would have had the uh, courage to support it, but also it really connected with things he himself was working on. So he was very, very interested in these. You know, the, the, the TWA building is probably the only building worthy of serious comparison. You can think of other projects by Candela and other shell work, some work in Germany. Ooh. Um, so we don't know what he saw, but you can see there that there was an identification like father-son. So he adopts, you could say, can we say that he adopts Utzon? And the trouble with children produce the parents, right? Not the parent producing the child. So if you adopt somebody, you become a different person. So it's quite possible that, that Saarinen becomes a different architect as a result of adopting Utzon. But at the same time, he keeps him as a child by saying, you can't do this project, you're too young. Um, I don't, there's not really a lot of evidence that, um, that Utz, I don't think that Utzon needs Ove Arab to do this building. Um, and certainly Ove Arab could never have done this building without Utzon. So I think, I think the whole idea of making the engineer have the same status as the architect uh, was a fatal mistake. Because uh, uh, Utzon was a, a paranoid guy. And you know, Woody Allen says paranoia is just another word for perceptive. So he, he saw things going against him, but if you're paranoid, you really see them, whereas if you don't, you just don't see them. He could see that Ove Arab was undermining him. So for example, he made all of the interiors in wood, a kind of a plywood, and worked with a crazy, very experimental plywood guy in Australia. And, the, and Ove Arab quietly sent a message to the client saying, I definitely wouldn't do it in wood, destroying two years of research. Now, if you see those wooden models, there isn't an architect on this planet that doesn't wish that those, model, that those interiors had been done. No matter how spectacular you think this building is, in my opinion, the wooden interiors that he had done would still be considered today, I think, the, the kind of real masterwork of this project. And Ove Arab removed it on the grounds that they just, it wouldn't be strong enough or whatever. No, no evidence at all, just a kind of anger at this young, arrogant architect that would not submit to the law of the engineer. Interestingly, at the beginning, it was a real romance. They really liked each other. So I'm adding to your question. You've got this weird dynamic between Saarinen and Utzon, and you've got an even weirder dynamic between the older over Arab. So of course, w w what your question implies is that one would want to do more research on what Saarinen said about this building and thought about this building and how he talked about it, like moving forward. And when, for example, he was explaining TWA, did he ever make a reference? I mean, one would have to do a lot of work. I don't think one ever can, can imagine that you will um, understand what's going on. 
but at least we can say that there was, with, with, without, without the, for, to, to put it in my language, without the foreign element that is Saarinen, this project could not have been done. The project became what it became because something from outside, Saarinen, came inside it and changed it. And it's always like this. So I think, you know, and probably what I said about over Europe is wrong, I just want it to be right. Like probably somebody could demonstrate that there's something they did, that without that it would have all failed. You guys are tricky, so you might say, well, okay, he hated over Europe, but the hatred of over Europe was part of the project, it's part of, how, part of why it worked. Right? If they loved each other, maybe you got a boring building. Yeah. Yes. It's also implies that you need to know about the case by some images or some particular ideology that you have about where you're going. Yes. What happens if you don't know anything about that case? You can't visualize it, you don't have any particular thing. Like I'm trying to put it in the context of present day architecture of like just trying to think of it in that sense that you have no perception or imagery or an intellect, uh, let's say a kind of uh, set a basic of understanding where you're going, but how would change be before you start the journey at the place where you are? Um, but you can't not know about a place. Can you? How could I not know about a place? But it is like an imagination. Like yeah, but you, but you, can, you see, the moment you think it's a place, <laughs> then you know about it. Right, so there is actually not, there is not this thing where, where you don't know about a place. Um, so you can't not know a place, but also you cannot ever totally know a place. So the word place ca catches an enigma. Um, um, if place was place, right, and if local identity was really local, you don't need anybody to talk about it. It will always do its thing. It's, it's a, so, so the idea of the identity of place is, a, is constructed, and it's constructed for, all, for, for, for many, many reasons, but it's produced. It's an artwork. So what an architect produces is not the building that they bring, but the sense of the place in which the building is placed. So basically, um, uh, a building is an instrument for, for making you see your world differently, but actually to see your world differently is to see it for the first time, right? So, so I'm not answering your question very well, but you actually can never have a place in mind that you don't know anything about, right? Um, the word place marks the beginning crudely marks the beginning of an enigma. Yeah, but that's normal, right? I know that project. I know that project because coming from New Zealand, I went to Torino where I saw the work of an English architect based in Frankfurt who looked at the photographs of the place in India of the building by the architect from Germany. That's normal. Right? That's just a basic circuit. That's not even very complicated. I'm just describing the most uh, obvious. So, so that's what I mean. Journey is a vibration. Um, so, so if it's a vibration, the, the, the uh, architect can claim to be tuning in to the vibration. Not, that's why we can get away with this claim that we are just tuning in, but also cha you know, changing, making visible the, the you know, you can feel a, you can feel, uh, a vibration. It's actually very, I, this is no more true of contemporary architecture than of classical architecture. Classical architecture says, the world is a lousy copy, a third rate copy of the ama amazing, a degraded Xerox of the eternal ideas. Architecture is a second rate copy, which elevates it out of the world and communicates something better of what the ideas is. So the Greek temple is a spaceship, so it's something in this world that takes you out of this world to catch a taste for that which is beyond all worlds, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's exactly the same cycle. It, 
is the Greek temple coming towards us from the world of the perfect ideas, which is a world without form, without material? Is it, is it an ambassador of that world? Cannot be, since this is a world without substance. But it cannot be either an ambassador of this degraded uh, uh, world, including nature, trees, people, and so on, that cannot know its beauty, because it cannot know anything, because it's a third-rate copy. So architecture arrives in the enigma and claims to have access and participate in both worlds. So the architect slides, uh, I'm sorry for the analogy, between the ground and the air, sits in the gap. You see, and you see what, 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 what Utzon is doing is, is placing himself and us between what we believe to be stable, the ground, and that which always moves. Uh, the air. It turns out to be totally inverted. The thing on the ground doesn't belong to the ground. It doesn't represent the ground. Uh, it's dishonest to the ground. Anyway, I think two questions is already too, too many. Um, uh, thanks, thanks for uh, putting up with me.